Today, a great question was brought up, and it was talking about David's greatest sin. And uh, how did it, you know, that the repercussions of what he did and how it affected, you know, how it affected him, how did it affect his family, and how did it affect his kingdom ultimately? And uh, what could have been done differently if he would have heeded and, and, you know, done what he was supposed to do? Today we're going to, we'll talk about it a little bit. There's a lot of reading, so you have to bear with me and really, I mean, go back afterward. You would definitely want to like watch it again, reread, and then maybe if you come up with something, please post it down below. I love discussion as far as that. It's the Word of God. You can never get too much of it. So what we're going to do is we're going to, let's, let's define what sin is for people who may not know what David's greatest sin. We know David as he killed the Goliath with the stone. We all know that. That is a very, you know, a very popular Bible story that happened. So let's talk about sin. What is sin? So the dictionary has it as an immoral act considered to be a transgression against divine law. Well, this is definitely Old Testament. So before Jesus came, uh, they had lived by the law of Moses, as we know, and with the Ten Commandments and you know, with other parts of the way of life that they have established. So anything that was against God or broken one of the one of the commandments was considered to be a sin. So what was the question here is what was considered to be David's greatest sin? You know? Take a minute, think about it. So let's dive into it. We're gonna be in Second Samuel. Uh, one of my favorite books. It's a lot of action going on. Uh, it, David, to me, is one of the guys that, you know, he did a lot. I'd love to, you know, when, one day, you know, this world's over and it's wrapped up and done. I get to meet David one day. That's going to be a cool conversation. So let's talk about it. This is going to be chapter 11, 2 Samuel. Uh, we're going to probably go through the whole chapter. We're going to read it really quick. So that way we understand really what was David's greatest sin, Okay. Here we go. It happened in the spring of the year at the time when kings go out to battle that David sent Joab and his servants with him and all Israel and they destroyed the people of Ammon and besieged Rabbah but David remained at Jerusalem. Now I'll tell you we'll stop right there in the first in the first scripture there. Let's talk about what happened there. So this is a sign that Something's going, fixing that is is off because it says there when it was spring of the year, when kings go out to battle, and yet David remained at Jerusalem. So already we can see here something's not right. It's like a break in here that we can see, you know, something's going on with David. Let's let's dial in and let's find out what's what's fixing to happen. So that right there is problem number one. David should have went to battle, and things wouldn't have turned out like they fixed him to. Then it happened one evening that David arose and went from his bed and walked onto the roof of the king's house. And from the roof he saw a woman bathing, and the woman was very beautiful to behold. So David sent and inquired about the woman. And someone said, Is she not Bathsheba, the daughter of Eliam, the wife of Uriah the Hittite? So let's stop there. So he's wanting to inquire on this woman. So he's like, he almost did like a, he he did he took a second look, sort of. So he saw this woman and she was naked bathing on the roof. He should have immediately left and got, got away from this. Get away from that. In these times, I would like to tell you personally, me, you need to be more of a Joseph instead of a David at this moment. Joseph... When the Potiphar's wife came at him, what did he do? My boy ran, son. Gone. Faster than Bolt. David didn't. He, he took a second look and went for an inquiry to find out who this was. So, in verse 4, Then David sent messengers and took her. And she came to him, and he lay with her. For she was cleansed from her impurity, and she returned to her house. And then the woman conceived. So she sent and told David and said, I am with child. 
okay, right there. So he he committed the act of adultery. Okay, that's that's a commandment broken for sure. Let's keep reading. So in verse six, then David sent to Joab saying, "Send me Urah the Hittite." And Joab sent Urah the to David. When Urah had come to him, David asked how Joab was doing and how the people were doing and how the war prospered. So he's making a little bit of small talk here. Hey, how's it going? How's the war going? Um, and David said to Urah, go down to your house, and wash your feet. So Urah departed from the king's house and the gift of food from the king followed him. But Urah slept at the door of the king's house with all the servants of his lord and did not go down to his house. So when they told David, saying, Urah did not go down to his house. And David said unto Urah, do you not come from a journey? Did you not go down to your house? So you're, did you not travel? Are you tired? Did you not go to your house? Uh, and Urah said to David, The ark of Israel and Judah are dwelling in tents, and my lord Joab, the servants of my lord, are encamped in the open fields. Shall I go to my house to eat and drink and to lie with my wife as you live and as your soul lives? I will not do this thing. Then David said to Urah, Wait here today, also tomorrow, and I will let you depart. So Urah remained in Jerusalem that next day. Now when David called him, he ate and drank before him, and he made him drunk. And at the evening he went out to lie in his bed with the servants of the Lord, of his Lord, but he did not go down to his house. In the morning it happened that David wrote a letter to Joab and sent it to the hand of Urah, by the hand of Urah, and he wrote in the letter saying, Set Urah in the forefront of the hottest battle and retreat from him that he may be struck down and die. So let's stop there. So now, at this point, David didn't go into battle like the other kings did. That's not really a per se a sin, but that we know of. But as far as that, he didn't do that. He committed adultery, and from this, now he has plotted a way to kill Bathsheba's husband, the one he has committed adultery with. Okay? Let's keep going. In verse 16, So it was while Joab besieged the city that he assigned Urah to a place where he knew there were valiant men. Then the men of the city came out and fought with Joab, and some of the people of the servants of David fell. And Urah the Hittite died also. So right there, I mean, verse 16, it says that he signed him to a place to where he knew there would be men there that would kill him for sure. Then the men, they fought, and the other servants of David fell, and then Urah also died as well. So now, the, he also pretty much there, he committed murder as well. He planned this man's death, so that way it's, it's, it doesn't look as bad as it is, so he could definitely have Bathsheba and take her as his wife and I mean he's already laid with her and done his thing there which was a sin now he's done this now before we continue we will I will tell you that already back in law in those in the Old Testament and you were under law uh, those two were pretty much considered to be like known as the greatest sin now we know that God sees sin equally sin is sin and he detests all of it so, but it was known that these two were like the greatest of the sins there that was going on. And the penalty for those back in those days was death. It really was. So, uh, that's how serious these crimes were that David, that he had, what he had committed. So, as far as him, when he did these things, it's for him, what did it, how did it affect him? This is going to affect, it affects his, his he corrupts his morals it, it, it's going to compromise his integrity, everything he stood for. Uh, everything he stood for is now contradicted. There's, I mean, it's, it's going gonna, it's gonna to fall apart into a hot mess is what it's fixing to do. Let's continue reading. Then Joab sent and told David all these things concerning of war and charged the messenger saying, when you have finished telling the matters of the war to the king, if it happens that the king's wrath rises... Okay, if he gets mad and he says to you, why do you approach so near to the city when you fought? Did you not know that they would shoot from the wall? So he's, you know, trying to 
plan out the conversation. Who struck Ablamech, the son of Jerubasheth? Sorry, I butcher some of these words. They're a little harder for me. Was it not a woman who cast a piece of a milestone on him from the wall so that he died in Thebes? Why did you go near the wall? Then you shall say to him, your servant Ura the Hittite died also. So bam, throw it out there as quick as you could. So the messenger went and came and told David all that Joab had sent by him. And the messenger said to David, Surely the men prevailed against us and came out to us in the field. And then we drove them back as far as the entrance of the gate. The archer shot from the wall at your servants, and some of the king's servants are dead. And your servant Urah the Hittite has died also. Then David said to the messenger, Thus you shall say to Joab, Do not let this thing displease you, for the sword devours one, as well as another. Strengthen your attack against the city and overthrow it, so encourage him. Verse 26, When the wife of Ura heard that Ura, her husband, was dead, she mourned for her husband. And when her mourning was over, David sent and brought her to his house, and she became his wife and bore him a son. But the thing that David has done displeased the Lord. That in itself shows, I mean, the last four or five words of this whole chapter here had done displeased the Lord. I mean, what displeases the Lord? Anything that's against him? Sin? So in all of that, that was the sin that was committed. Adultery and murder. The greatest sin that David messed up on. So what we're going to do, um, let's continue on into how how does this reverberate into David's life here, which is we'll flip over to the next chapter, turn with me to chapter 12. Uh, this is where it comes into Nathan's parable and David's confession. So this is where he repents because he knows he's messed up. Chapter 12, okay. The Lord sent Nathan to David, and when he came to him and said to him, There were two men in one city, one rich, the other poor. The rich man had exceedingly many flocks and herds, but the poor man had nothing, except one little ewe lamb which he had bought and nourished and grew to, up together with him and with his children. It ate its own food and drank from its own cup and lay in his, and lay in his bosom like he was a daughter to him. And the traveler came to the rich man who refused to take from his own flock and from his own herd to prepare for a wayfaring man who had come to him. But he took that poor man's lamb and prepared it for the man who had to come. This, verse 5, here we go. So David's anger was greatly aroused against the man. And he said to Nathan, as the Lord lives... The man who has done this shall surely die. And he shall restore fourfold for the lamb because he did this thing because he had no pity. And at this time, verse 7, Nathan reveals and says to David, Then Nathan said to David, You are the man. Thus the Lord God of Israel, I anointed you, king over Israel. I delivered you from the hand of Saul. I gave you your master's house, your master's wives into your keeping, and I gave you your house of Israel and Judah, and that it, and if that had been too little, I also would have given you much more. Why have you despised the commandment of the Lord to do evil in his sight? You have killed Urah the Hittite with the sword. You have taken his wife to be your wife, and you have killed him with the sword of the people of Ammon. Now, therefore, the sword shall never depart from your house, because you have despised me, and you have taken the wife of Ur the Hittite to be your wife. Thus saith the Lord. Behold, I will raise up adversity against you from your own house, 
I will take your wives before your eyes and give them to your neighbors. He shall lie with your wives in the sight of the son, of this son. For you did it secretly, but I will do things before all of Israel, before the son. So David said to Nathan, I have sinned against the Lord. Right then and there, he knew he had messed up. He done stepped in it, son. So in this, this whole verse 7 there to verse 13, it breaks it down. And Nathan, being sent by God, told David exactly what he did. Because it doesn't matter who you are, where you're at. Sin will find you out. The Bible says, I believe it's in Romans, that the wages of sin is death. Sin is nothing to play with. You can dabble with it and it will overtake you. This, this is David's greatest sin. And it shows right here. Let's keep going. I have sinned against the Lord. And Nathan said to David, The Lord also has put away your sin, for you shall not die. Right then and there. He knew the wages for those two sins was death. But that is him telling him, the Lord has put away your sin. You shall not die. However, because by this deed you have given great occasion to the enemies of the Lord to blaspheme, the child also who is born to you shall surely die. Then Nathan departed to his house. So Nathan tells me, he tells him pretty much, you're not going to die for this. The Lord has put your sin away. He has forgave you for that. But the, the child that is born... He's going to die. That's what's going to happen. Or going to going to be born or is born. He's going to die. So here we go into this next part. Uh, this would be the death of David's son. We can break it down. This is going to trickle down into how this affects his family. So how does this affect him? It corrupts his morals. You can see where he's turned his back on uh, some of the commandments. It's compromised his whole integrity, who he is what he stood for. I mean, this man being the king of Israel, upholding God's right, I mean, his righteousness, taking down the Philistines, charging in, taking land, what belonged to to Israel to start off with, this is, this is what it was about. And then from this moment, from this greatest sin, it is now falling apart. So here we go. So this is the, the, the death of David's son. The Lord struck the child that Uriah's wife bore to David, and it became ill. See, the Lord did this because it was prophesied that it was going to happen. David therefore pleaded with God for the child. David fasted and went in and lay all night on the ground so that the elders of the house arose and went, around and went to him to raise him up from the ground, but he did not, nor did he eat food with him. Verse 18, then on the seventh day it came to pass that the child died. Seven days and that child died. And the servants of David were afraid to tell him that the child was dead, for they said, Indeed, while the child was alive, we spoke to him. He would not heed our voices. How can we tell him that the child is dead? He may do some harm. They're worried about him going crazy, going pretty much mantic is what they're worried about. Like, how do we tell him this? So in verse 19, when David saw his servants who were whispering, David perceived that the child was dead. So he kind of heard them talking and whispering because they, they were scared to tell him. Therefore, David sent his servants, is, his, is the child dead? That's what he asked, is the child dead? And they said, he is dead. So David arose from the ground, washed and anointed himself, changed his clothes and went into the house of the Lord and worshipped. Then they went, then he went into his own house where he was, when he requested, they set food before him and he ate. He finally ate. Then the servant said to him, what is it, what is this that you have done? You fasted and wept for the child while he was alive, but when the child died, you arose and ate food. And he said, while the child was alive, I fasted and wept for I said, who can tell whether the Lord will be gracious to me that the child may live? But now that the child is dead, why should I fast? It's over with, pretty much. Can I bring him back? The answer to that is no. Shall I shall go to him, but he shall not return to me. 
So now that the child has died, his fast is over because he was begging pretty much God, you know, can you heal this child? Be Please, will you be gracious to me and let the child live? The answer to that is no, he did not. He told him the child was going to die. The child is going to die. Um, so, and he knows the only way he's going to see this is when one day he dies, he's, he can go see the child in heaven, uh, but he's not coming back. So now, in verse 24, Then David comforted Bathsheba, his wife, the one he committed adultery with, and now he is his wife, and went into her and lay with her. So she bore another son and called his name Solomon. Now the Lord loved him, and he sent word by the hand of Nathan, the prophet, so he called his name Jediah because of the Lord, or Jedidiah because of the Lord. Uh, I will tell you that that's some hard stuff. I never, I have never lost a child, and dear Lord God, I pray I never, because that would be just extremely, extremely hard. Um, so we can talk about his family. Some of that, how does it affect his family? Nathan gets called in, tells him everything he's done, that his child's gonna die, and the child dies. We can go over now, since that was a, that was a good little bit of uh, of scripture. So let's go over to let's read about let's see what happens to uh, m other sons of David. All of this is trickling down and happening because of the greatest sin. This is how it it just it's a ripple effect because of the sin. It it's just it's it's terrible is what has happened. So here we go. So let's go over. After this, all this, Absalom, the son of David, had a lovely sister whose name was Tamar. And Ammon, the son of David, loved her. Ammon was so distressed over his sister Tamar that he became sick. Well, yeah, because that's pretty much sick with perversion. Uh, for she's for she was a virgin. That's pretty much it in a nutshell right there. And it was improper for Ammon to do anything to her. But Ammon had a friend who was named Jonadab and the son of Shemia, David's brother. Now Jonadab was a very crafty man and said to him, Why are you, the king's son, becoming thinner day after day? Will you not tell me? Ammon said to him, I love Tamar, my brother Absalom's sister. Uh, so Jonadab told him, lie down. They're, so they've come up with this scheme now. So lie down in your bed and pretend to be ill. And when your father comes to you and say, please let my sister Tamar come and give me food and prepare the food in my sight that I may see it and eat it from her hand. Then Ammon lay down and pretend to be ill. And when the king came to see him, Ammon said to the king, please let Tamar, my sister, come and make a couple of cakes and for me in my sight, that I may eat from your hand. And David sent home uh, to Tamar, saying, Now go to your brother Ammon's house and prepare food for him. So Tamar went uh, to her brother's house, and he was lying down, and then she took the flour and kneaded it, made cakes in his sight, and baked the cakes. She took it, uh, the pan and placed them out before him, but he refused to eat. Then Ammon said, have everyone go out from me. And they all went out from him. Amon said to Tamar, Bring the food into the bedroom, that I may eat from your hand. And Tamar took the cakes she had made and brought them to Amon, her brother, in the bedroom. Now, verse 11. When she brought them to eat, he took hold of her and said, Come lie with me, my sister. So that's what it was all. That was the whole scheme to get her in her in his room, feeding food because he was sick, and then he was going to make her lay down with him. But she answered him, "No, brother, my brother, do not force me to do such a things that should be done. Things should be done in Israel. No such thing should be done in Israel. Do not do this disgraceful thing. And I, where could I take? And where? And I, where could I take my shame? As for you, you would be like one of the fools in Israel. Now, therefore, please." Speak to the king, for he will not withhold me from you. However, he would not heed her voice and began stronger than she. Forced, he forced her to lay with her. That's what he did. He forced her 
to lay with, you know, to lay down. That's what he did. Then Ammon hated her exceedingly, so that the hatred with which he hated her was greater than the love with he had for her. And Ammon said, Arise and be gone. And she said to him, No, indeed, this evil of sending me away is worse than the other that you did to me. Basically, what this is doing is now that he has defiled and, and raped her is what has happened here. Now she's no good because now there's pretty much no man in Israel that's going to take her because she's not pure, she's not a virgin anymore, and her brother defied her. This is David's children now. This is how all this is affecting his kids and the way of life for them. All this from the from the David's greatest sin. Um, all I mean, it's it is it's pretty gross. So when this is coming through, we can we can tick on over here to uh, let's go take a look at uh, Absalom, I believe. And then you can see how he turned out. Let me pull that up real quick. Now he's gone. Okay, so before we, we change gears here, uh, let's keep reading. Right, there's she, okay, so let's, let's keep reading here. So she said to him, No, uh, this evil sending me away is worse than the others you did to me. But he would not listen to her. Then he called his servants who was attending him and said, Here, put this woman out for me. Bolt the door behind her. Now she had on a robe of many colors, for the king's virgin daughters wore such apparel. Uh, and his servant put her out and bolted the door behind her. Then Tamar put ashes on her head and tore her robe of many colors that was on her and laid her hand upon her head and went away crying bitterly. And Absalom... Her brother said to her, Has Ammon, your brother, been with you? But now hold your peace, my sister. He is your brother. Do not take this thing to heart. So Tamar remained desolate in her brother Absalom's house. But, in verse 21, But the king David heard of all these things, and he was very angry. And Absalom spoke to his brother Abnon, neither good nor bad for Absalom hated Abnon because he had forced his sister Tamar so in all of this you can see that his family is starting to fall apart uh, his kids I mean now you got hatred you got a uh, Tamar who's been raped by another brother and Absalom is I mean he's already fed up with all this uh, you can you can continue reading on from verse 23 and verse 30. What, I mean, you can about figure what's fixing to happen here. Uh, and it came to pass two full years Absalom and, uh, had sheep shears in Baal Hazar, which is near Ephraim. So Absalom invited all the king's son, and Absalom came to the king and said, King, kindly note your servants had sheep shears. Please let the king and his servants go with your servant. But the king said to Absalom, No, my son, let us not all go now, lest we be burdened to you. Then he urged him to say, But he would not go, and he blessed him. Then Absalom said, If not, please let my brother Abnon go with us. And when the king said to him, Why should he go with you? But Absalom urged him. So he let Abnon and all the other king's sons go with him. That's what he wanted. And you're fixing to find out why he wanted him to go. Now Absalom had commanded his servant, saying, Watch now, when Amnon's heart is merry with wine, so when he's drunk, and when I say to you, Strike Amnon, then kill him. Do not be afraid. I have, I, have I not commanded you? Be courageous and valiant. So that servants of Absalom did to Amnon as Absalom had commanded. Then all the kings arose, each one got on his mule and fled. So we can, I mean, we'll skip some a little bit, just save a little bit of time. But when all this happened, he was mad <clears throat> for what he did to his sister, Tamar. So now in verse 33, we can read, Now therefore let not my lord the king take this thing to his heart to think 
that all the king's sons are dead, for only Ammon, not Ammon, only Abnon is dead. In doing that, Absalom flees. Um, so he eventually, he does end up killing, having it done. It's over with. So now there's blood on that. So that's trickled down. So after this has happened, what else does Absalom get into? Well, he commits, now in David's reign, he commits treason. So this is going to be, now we can skip, we're going from that chapter, which would be chapter 13. Now we're going to flip over to chapter 15 here in 2 Samuel. And it's going to be about Absalom's treason, okay? So, you know, after this had happened, Absalom provided himself chariots and horses and 50 men to run before him. Uh, he would rise early. It talks about how uh, he would... Um, let's see. Okay, so now Absalom would rise early and stand beside him uh, the way to the gate. So it was whenever anyone who had a lawsuit came to the king for a decision that Absalom would call to him and say... What city are you from? You would, and he would say, Your servant is from such and such tribe of Israel. And Absalom would say to him, Look, your case is good and right, but there is no deputy uh, of the king to hear you. Moreover, Absalom would say, Oh, there I were made judge in the land. And everyone who has any suit or case could come to me, and I would give him justice. And so it was whenever anyone came near to bow down to him that he would put out his hand and take him and kiss him. In this manner, Absalom acted towards all Israel who came to the king for judgment. So Absalom stole the hearts of many of Israel. So now he's acting as king, uh, which is treason. You cannot do that in a king-style setting of a, of a reign, of a style of life. Um... That is treason. So when all this is going on, he and then we can skip down to verse 10. What else did he do? Then Absalom sent spies throughout all the tribes of Israel, saying, As soon as you hear the sound of the trumpet, then you all shall say, Absalom reigns in Hebron. And with Absalom went 200, 200 men invited from Jerusalem. They went along instantly and did not know anything. Then Absalom sent... Um, for, I want to say it's Hathiphalel, Hathiphalel, the Gileonite, David's counselor from the city, from Gilo, uh, while other offered sacrifices and conspiracies grew, the people with Absalom continually increased in numbers. So more and more people are now, they're getting on with this. He's going around whispering, telling lies, getting ready for this to happen. And what, what eventually does happen, I will tell you guys, uh, it makes David escape from Israel and all that, but he basically stages an insurrection trying to overthrow his father is what it's conviction. He's trying to become king, and his own son is now against him. David's son, Absalom, is now against David. He wants to be king, and now David's trying to deal with this. How does he, how does he deal with this? I mean, you just can't. So now... So the David's the first child's already dead. Not the first child, but the child with Bathsheba had died, the first one. Uh, you have the other child that we just read about. Um, he died. So now we're dealing with, and he died from Absalom. So now we're dealing with Absalom. We'll see what happens to him. Uh, into, let's flip over to, we can see what happens to him in chapter 18. Through all this a regime coming in and trying to overthrow David. In the middle of that, what happens to Absalom? So in chapter 18, let's go to verse 9, and let's read of that. Then Absalom met the servants of David. Absalom rode on a mule, and the mule went under a thick bows of a great terebinth tree. Okay? And his head caught in terebinth. So he was left hanging between heaven and earth, and the mule which was under him went on. Okay, so a little thing about Absalom is he had long hair, very beautiful hair, very beautiful kind of guy. Uh, he went under the, the mule went under this tree. His hair got caught up in the tree, which left him. And the mule kept going. He was kind of suspended there in air from the from the hair of his head stuck in this tree. Verse ten. Now a certain man saw it and told Joab and said, "I saw Absalom hanging in the terebinth tree." 
And he said, so Joab said to the man, you saw him and you didn't strike him there to the ground? I would have given you ten shekels of silver and a belt. But the men said it, you know, to Joab, though I received a thousand shekels of silver in my hand, I would not raise my hand against the king's son, for in our hearing that the king commanded you and Abishai and Atai, saying, Beware lest anyone touch the youngest man of Absalom. Otherwise I would have dealt falsely against my own life. For there is nothing hidden from the king, and you yourself would have set yourself against me. So David is given an order to not hurt his son Absalom is what's happened here. And he says he's not going to do it. Not against his king. So that tells you there that David, he still loves his son even though he's committed treason and trying to overthrow him. He has the heart that he loves his son. Let's keep going. Verse 14, Then Joab said, I cannot linger with you. And he shook. And what what happened there is, okay, let's go back. It's my own life. There's nothing. Okay, I would have set yourself against me. Verse 14, Then Joab said, I cannot linger with you. And he took three spears in his hand and thrust them through Absalom's heart while he was still alive in the midst of the terebinth tree. So he took three spears, went out to that tree, and thrust three spears into Absalom's heart while he was still alive in the midst of the terebinth tree. And ten young men who bore Jerob's armor surrounded Absalom and struck and killed him. So Joab blew the trumpet and the people returning to pursue Israel for Joab held back the people and they took Absalom and cast him into a large pit in the wood and laid a very large heap of stones over him. Then all of Israel fled everyone to his tent. Now Absalom in his lifetime had taken up taken and set up a pillar for himself which is in the king's valley for he said I have no son to keep my name in remembrance he called the pillar after his own name and to this day it's called Absalom's monument uh, you keep reading on in there and it, uh, it talks about when David hears Absalom's death I mean it tore him up he was pretty sad about it for sure so in this the sin we can talk about what was the sin. The sin was he committed adultery and the murder of Bathsheba's husband. Um, and the, uh, like I said, the adultery of sleeping with Bathsheba. Wow, you know, that was somebody's wife for sure. Should have been a Joseph and ran instead of a David in a second look. Um, how did this affect him? Well, he repented. It tore him up because he knew he messed up. He, they sent out that, uh, God sent that prophet to him and said, listen, and it pointed out and showed him. After David said that they should be killed, it was him, and God knew that he was wrong. So that that's how it affected him. It tore him up. Uh, it affected him specifically because in his last days of his kingdom, he grew old and he grew weak, and he knew he was washed up. That was what happened. Uh, how did it affect his family? Well, his first child with Bathsheba died. His uh, other children, his other two children. Uh, I mean, we read on there all this scripture together. Absalom died before you know all the Absalom died. That was his last one. He killed his other son because he raped his daughter. What a mess! What a mess! This is how sin can go down through generations and generations just because you sin it can be passed down I'm telling you guys thank God we don't live under law and we have Jesus that came to the cross that is what's most important right there so that's how it affected him that's how it affected his family but how did it affect his kingdom well with Absalom it affected all that it was plagued with riots uh, it, as it grew on longer and longer it grew weaker and weaker uh, after David's death, you know, he spent his last years there helping Solomon set up his his king, kingmanship and to build the temple. Uh, God honored, you know, all of that. But once that all that happened, Solomon finally died. Then after that, it split right after Solomon's death. 
Uh, even Solomon had issues in his king when he was king with, you know, uh, women and idols. And so it wasn't, it wasn't a very righteous kingship after that. It all trickled and fell apart is what happened. So I was, when I was preparing for, to talk about this, I read this interesting little article piece um, that I would love to share with you guys. Uh, we can be certain that if King David could, he would uh, make a different decision beginning by not taking a second look at Bathsheba. Then he would have gone, he would definitely would have gone into battle instead of staying home. We can be certain because the price of David's sin of adultery and murder was high. He spent the rest of his life regretting it. The, the words of the Lord given by the prophet haunted him. Absolutely. Absolutely. Um, the wages of sin is death. It says that in, in the book of Romans. As a result of one wrong decision, David's earthly kingdom began to fall apart through an inner contention and strife. Eventually, David received assurance that his soul would be delivered. That's, you can read that in the books of Psalm. Uh, Psalm 86, 12 to 13, you can read that. However, this assurance could not restore the consequence of his actions. Uh, he lost the blessings of a peaceful kingdom and a peaceful household, which were uh, interrelated because of the royal order of the ascension to the throne. But I urge you guys, I mean, this is a, I mean, a very valuable lesson that I believe we can look back at the Old Testament and learn from the wages of sin is death. How much can sin impact your life? One, two little sins that you've committed, how can that impact your life? I urge you guys to go back, read the book of 2 Samuel, really deep dive into it. Uh, I'm sure there's even more things that I didn't even see in there that can change your life, and maybe you can share them with me. Um, thank God we have Jesus that we can call upon and repent, because without that, we would be doomed forever. So while we have time, the Bible says we, you know, bide our time. We go out there and we tell people the love of Jesus. We go out there and we tell them we love them. Invite them to church. You know, if they, they need money, if they need clothes, feed the, the hungry, you know. You help them people. they just people. Being people is hard. This world is hard enough. And we need to be there for them. Greatest sin or not, we need to show them the love of Christ. Through the Old Testament, people say it's not important. But you can learn important values. It is the foundation of of where the Bible began. We still need to read through it. Global University that I'm going through has taught, I mean, we're learning more about, you know, the Old Testament. I'm doing a course about the Old Testament Overlook, uh, how important it is to keep that Old Testament in there. It You can back up. I mean, they reference each other so many times back and forth. Even Jesus, you know, they reference Isaiah all throughout there. Uh, without that foundation, he couldn't connect with the Jews as much as he did. So I'm telling you guys, while you have time, read and study the word and get into it. You'll be interested. Check out David's greatest sin. Read 2 Samuel for yourself, okay? Love you guys. If you need me, if you want to tell me something, hit it in the comments below. Uh, if you want to just deep dive in the word and don't know where to go, check out Global University. They're fantastic. Uh, they've always, I mean, their information is I mean, it's sound, sound doctrine. So I'm telling you, check it out. Okay? If you need me, holla, dudes.